Good evening, and thank you for everybody for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's the third of a series of lectures that Professor Kotkin is uh, giving uh, to the Institute. I was trying to figure out why we decided that this very special lecture, this is the only once in the year we have a, somebody whom we invite to give three lectures. And uh, my speculation is that probably this is the spirit of Charles Taylor who wrote a book on Hegel, so if you want to do something serious, it should be in three stages. So this is why we decided to come with the three lectures. Uh, probably for many of you who have been on the first two lectures, you're going to hear the third introduction of uh, Professor Kotkin. Uh, so I'll be very brief. You're here not because you don't know who he is, uh, but because you know. Uh, he's a professor in history and international relations in the Woodrow Wilson uh, Institute in the Princeton University and his fellow at the Hoover Institute in Stanford. In my humble opinion, probably the most interesting writer on anything uh, on Russia and the post-Soviet space. So, please, Professor Kotkin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, three lectures is very difficult and I appreciate that some of you are here again for the third time for the Aufhebel, as uh, Ivan described it. We'll see if we can really lift up. Um, so I I'm going to continue what I did the first two times and not really repeat much of the first two lectures, but I will give a little bit of analysis of what I've said up till now. So what have been the themes? The first theme is that we are dealing with success, meaning that we tend to speak mostly about crisis, about failure, but I instead think that the world today is a result of our success. It has been built by the West. The West has expanded to its greatest extent. Other places have copied the West, and, in fact, they've paid homage to the West by trying to undermine the West because it's so strong and so powerful. We always qualify success. Every time I say we talk about success, people say to me, but it depends. When I say crisis and failure, nobody says it depends who you're talking about. It depends which groups of the society. But success, for some reason, we have a difficult time admitting. The second point I've been making is that despite the success, nobody is happy. There is a malaise which is quite pronounced and needs to be explained. Uh, you can see I have borrowed from the preeminent philosopher of our time this problem that everything is amazing and nobody is happy. Uh, my third point has been that geopolitics is wrongly dismissed as the problem when in fact it is or can be the solution. We have an escape from geopolitics mentality. We have a fear of the return of geopolitics. For the right, that is to say people who consider themselves conservative, they are above geopolitics. There's a kind of pure American hegemony. For the left, geopolitics is so evil that it must be transcended with pooled sovereignty and multinational institutions. These are not only wrong, they're not only mistakes, but they're politically dangerous views. Because we got to where we were through geopolitics. The Cold War was won because of geopolitics. The war was built because of geopolitics, and it will be sustained only because geopolitics is our friend. Another point I've been making is nationalism. Once again, we are very dismissive of nationalism. Nationalism is a pejorative. We tend to see ourselves as international people, as transnational people, as cosmopolitan people. And so we hand nationalism over to our enemies, those who are not for freedom. They seize nationalism because we say that nationalism 
is not what we need. In fact, nationalism is just another word for politics. Politics can be defined as the struggle to define the nation. There are many different incarnations of the nation. Inside Austria, you have debates about what Austria is and what Austria should be. Those are debates about defining the nation. You can have an open nation. You can have a nation that agrees to pool its sovereignty and join multinational organizations like the EU or others. But if you refuse to engage with nationalism, if you believe nationalism is your enemy, you are committing once again a political mistake, just like with refusing geopolitics. It's very important to seize nationalism and make it work as an instrument for you, including defending the European Union. If you give up nationalism, if you cede nationalism, you are automatically in the minority. Transnationalism, internationalism is ipso facto a minority ideology. Only nationalism can be majoritarian. We've seen this problem now, unfortunately, unfolding. Okay, and now the key point, which I hope to cover in more depth today, is this problem of resentment. When we see democratic mechanisms able to reveal what we might call the losers of some of our processes. That is to say, the people whose voices have not been heard, they feel the system does not work for them, and yet, because of democratic mechanisms, they've been able to give voice to their resentment, to their disappointment, to their anger. We call this now populism. Populism is, of course, just another word for politics. There is nothing particularly exceptional about populism. Moreover, it's not the end of civilization when poor people or people who've been excluded from political processes gain a voice. You can argue that they are, they are represented by mendacious politicians, and I can't disagree with that. But then again, the establishment politicians have a lot to answer for, including on the question of mendacity. So the losers surface, the resentment, but today I'm going to talk a little bit more about resentment not inside a country, but in the international system as a whole, because that's what we're witnessing. We're witnessing a sense of losers surfacing or people feeling angry or people feeling resentment at the international system and attempting a kind of populist politics in international terms. Once again, this is not particularly shocking. It's not particularly earth-shattering. I believe everything on this list is more or less banal. I don't think anything here is very deep, except maybe this one. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think it bears remembering. So let me talk a little bit about the fascism-communism question from the last lecture. Once again, I said I wouldn't repeat what I said from the lectures, but I will just review a little bit. Or as my wife always likes to say, I heard you twice already the first time. <laughs> yeah. We used to call it, when I was growing up, a broken record. But we don't have records anymore. They used to go around on this spinning thing and play music. And sometimes they wouldn't work anymore, and the same piece would repeat and repeat and repeat. But since now we have CDs, it's a little bit different. Actually, I don't think we have CDs anymore. <laughs> Just joking. OK, so what did I actually argue? I argued that communism ceased to work for the pigs. The pigs, as you know from Animal Farm, was uh, the group that Orwell chose for the communist elites. Instead, they discovered that illiberalism with private property and markets is much superior to illiberalism with this communism nonsense. Now, this was not their motivation for overthrowing communism. A lot of them were communists. 
That was the problem with communism. The problem with communism was there were too many communists. However, despite this not being their motivation, it was a prime cause of the collapse because they lived in a capitalist world and they suffered under a capitalist example or sphere of influence. Remember I talked about the East German elites? How did they mark their status? They wore Western suits. They had Western perfume for their wives and mistresses. They drove Western cars. Their entire life was completely suffused with status symbols of the capitalist world. Right? This was true of the entire bloc. This was true of the Soviet Union as well. So they lived in a capitalist world. And this was their problem. There was a structural crushing of communism by the capitalist sphere of influence known as the West. Now, modern authoritarianism, which is the rule of the few in the name of the many, the rule of the few in the name of the many, modern authoritarianism, old authoritarianism was the rule of the few in the name of the few. Now we have the rule of the few in the name of the many. And you'll remember from Tocqueville that he predicted that the authoritarians, the absolutists, would not be able to legitimize themselves in the new era of democracy. He was right about many things, but he was wrong about this. They've been able to figure out how to do the rule of the few in the name of the many. And I said there were four components. There was the coercive apparatus. You can't really get by without the coercive apparatus. There was the revenue stream. Not economic growth. They don't really need that. They need cash flow. There was control over life chances to be able to reward and punish people by denying them their job, by denying them perquisites. And they needed a deep well of powerful stories. All of this was brittle without the stories. The threats, the enemies, the grievances, and of course, the national glory stolen. Right? And I said that this authoritarianism, or illiberalism with private property and markets, is not a new phenomenon, nor is it particularly, uh, let's say, shocking. Instead, it's a long-standing phenomenon. Now, you can calibrate the amount of violence you use. You can calibrate the xenophobia. Violence and xenophobia for authoritarian regimes are like the accordion. They can open it wide, or they can close it a little bit. If, for example, the national glory stolen mythology is very effective, if people buy into this, then the need for the violence can be reduced. And the cost of the violence, they don't have to pay the regimes. So it's blasphemous to suggest that there's any connection with fascism. Remember what I said about the problem of fascism and communism. I said that the right has a notion that fascism and communism are equal, that they're the same that they're part of totalitarianism. This was very effective in the Cold War against communism, to equate it with fascism. Because if you can equate it with fascism, Hitler is the gold standard of evil. And if you can make something equal to Hitler, who's irredeemable, then communism can also be irredeemable. It was a brilliant notion, totalitarianism. Right? And then there's a left-wing version of the problem, which is that communism was anti-fascism. Communism was anti-fascism, meaning that they were the ones who struggled against fascism. Of course, this leaves out the fact that communism was a culprit in bringing fascism to power. This part of the story is normally suppressed. So we have a mythology of equation, and then we have a mythology of an antimony. And I said, in fact, that the difference between fascism and communism was that communism was over. And I still believe that that holds. And the reason communism is over is because it didn't work for the pigs. And they will not bring it back. 
they will instead mutate, evolve in the direction of illiberalism with private property and markets. So if you talk about calibrating the violence and the xenophobia, you can actually talk about a continuum of modern authoritarianism. And you can put Mussolini in that continuum, and you can put Hitler in that continuum. You can't put Stalin in that continuum because he was a communist. They didn't have private property and markets. But it's very, very blasphemous to suggest this. First, you're trying to reduce the uniqueness of Hitler and Nazism. Secondly, you're playing the leftist game of potentially equating Orban or Trump with fascism, which of course uh, doesn't really work because they don't have the kind of power that the fascists were able to command, right? So what you're talking about is a difference in epoch. The post-World War I epoch, when violence in politics was not only a uh, high level, but considered normally necessary. It was a norm to be violent, and that's how you recruited people. And of course, the xenophobia or the anti-Semitism were core to the Nazi project in a way that they're only toyed with in the regimes today. So the idea that there's a continuum right, is a dangerous one politically, but intellectually, I think it can potentially be justified. So that's the only point I was making, however, was that communism is over. I was not necessarily suggesting that they weren't, that the right didn't have a point in equating them. I was not suggesting that the left didn't have a point, that many communists resisted fascism. I know the history, just like you do. I was merely suggesting that communism didn't last and is not coming back, because it doesn't work for the elites. You can't steal as much property. You can't loot as much public money. You can't own as much, right? Under communism, as you can do post-communism. It's a very simple equation. Once again, it was not the motivation for the communist capitulation. That was a story about living in a capitalist world. And the capitalist world, which we call the West, crushing them in the daily life competition. And then Gorbachev, accidentally, unwittingly, destroying the system from within as he tried to fix it, right? So it's not causal directly, but nonetheless, it's the main structural fact that the framework that allows everything to happen. Anyway, so that was what I tried to say the last lecture. What about today? <laughs> as you know, I told you already that I took this photograph myself. <laughs> That's the American bald eagle you recognize. And you see him riding it the way he rides everything. So this is what we think. This is our image of what is going on. It couldn't be farther from the truth. This image is complete nonsense, as amusing as it is. We have a predicament, Russia's predicament, which is that it wants to be a great power. It considers itself what we call a providential power, a power under providence or under God, right? It has a special mission in the world. This is the core. This is the core of Russia. The problem, however, is that they are not the greatest power. They consider themselves a providential power, but they are relatively weak vis-a-vis -vis the West. There's a gulf or an asymmetry, a gap. And so what you see in Russian history is you see the quest for a strong state to manage or maybe even overcome the gap with the West. There's a czarist version of this. There's obviously a Stalinist version of this. And there's a Putin version of this. Recourse to the state because we're weak vis-a-vis -vis the West. We feel threatened. We perceive that the West is too strong for us. But we should be in the same rank or maybe even higher than them. The result of this quest for a strong state is you get economic spurts followed by prolonged stagnation. Time and time again. Coercion, state as an instrument, bash the country a little bit forward, and then you end up in a hole. That's where they are again. It takes different versions. The Tsarist version, the Stalinist version, the Putin version are very different. I know the history just like you do. 
but there is a pattern. Finally, the, the quest for the strong state culminates in what? What does it culminate in? Does it culminate in a strong state? Never. It culminates in personal rule every single time. It's astonishing. And then we have the conflation of state interests with the political fortunes of one person. So people say you can't criticize Putin because he's defending Russian state interests. But he's not defending Russian state interests. I can be a Russian patriot and criticize that regime because that regime is defending itself. That regime is about maintaining itself in power. It's a personal rule problem. This is Russia's predicament. That's where they are again. They got themselves into the same predicament once more. We talked about democracy in the 90s. But what happened in the 90s? What happened in the 90s was the gap with the West grew even more. The gap with the West kept growing. So the state collapse problem was one element, but the other problem was vis-a-vis -vis the West worsening relationship in terms of the power symmetry. And so here we go, quest for the strong state, Putin, overcome or manage this weakness vis-a-vis -vis the West, culmination in personal rule. Hard to believe, but we see the pattern. Look, this is all we've got. It looks very large. Crimea, you know about the two provinces in eastern Ukraine, right? The Transnistria Strip, which is Boris Yeltsin's confection from 1992, and the two pieces in Georgia. All told, it's not very much. This is the Russian sphere of influence. There it is. That's your Russian sphere of influence. That's where they've succeeded. Okay. How about the Eurasian Economic Union? You heard a lot about it. Their version, their competition for the European Union, right? Well, it started with the three, and then they strong-armed two more in. So they've got five. But a lot of them refused to join. Can you imagine Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan refused to join? Forget about these other ones. During the negotiations, they even removed any of the political dimensions of the European Union. So the ones supposedly closest to Russia balked at political aspects of the Union. But even if every single member who could join, joined, what would it be? Would it have advanced technology? Would it have significant financial resources? No. And moreover, guess what? They agreed to harmonize their Eurasian Economic Union with China's One Belt, One Road. So China is creating a greater Eurasia, but a real one. A real one. So here, we showed this the first lecture, here's the GDP of the Eurasian Union. There it is. You see Armenia? You see Kyrgyzstan? You don't see them, because their economies are invisible. There's nothing there, unfortunately. This, by the way, is 2014, when the ruble-dollar exchange rate was still um, very different, about 30 rubles to the dollar. Now, you're not at 2 trillion, but you're down here at 1.27 trillion dollar economy because of the collapse following the oil price collapse and the, the ruble's devaluation. So these things are even smaller. Right? Ukraine's entire economy today is not even a hundred billion. Not even a hundred billion. So I tell you, this is their sphere of influence. Look at it. He's riding that American eagle. Look at their sphere of influence. Here's the language. 1994 Russian language. 2016 Russian language. Look at the direction of Russian language. Latvia. Ukraine from 34% to 24%, first language in the home, Russian. Georgia, Turkmenistan, Lithuania. Only one country has increased Russian language usage in the home. That's it. 
Otherwise, the Russian sphere of influence is declining in the former Soviet space, declining precipitously. These are merely facts, I understand. We could talk a lot about the other aspects of soft power, but this chart enables you to see what's going on. Russia is a unidimensional power. That's the whole Russian GDP, one to seven trillion. Look at the size of the Russian economy, one fifteenth, one fifteenth the size of the United States economy, and not even one fifteenth the EU economy. The Soviet Union was one third the size of the U.S. economy. Russia is one fifteenth. You can do the math yourself. Under two percent of global GDP. What kind of sphere of influence is this? No alliances. Military modernization, yes, a little bit. But does that work for great power status over the long term? I don't think so. Right? Russia is a difficult place to understand. Simultaneously strong and weak, authoritarian and yet lawless. Right? Traditionalist in its values and yet valueless or cynical. Right? Everything could change overnight, and yet in 300 years it looks the same. It's a crazy place, right? It's hard to understand. It's an amazing civilization. Russia is incredible. What they've given to the world and what they've achieved. I've spent much of my life studying it, but I have to tell you, it's in decline in a way that's breathtaking. The anguish of patriotic Russians. It's the most corrupt, highly urbanized, well-educated country in the world, and it has a lot of competition. <laughs> Massive long-term underinvestment. The economy is tiny, and capacity is at 85 percent. They don't even have any slack. Yes, can you imagine? How about their labor pool? Shrinking. And a lot of it is employed in what you call low-value added, like repressive apparatus, private security, right? Yeah, that's Russia today. Hemorrhaging talent every year, twenty to thirty thousand professionals. That's a lot of people to lose. Do you know? How about this? Ten million Russians are abroad beyond the FSU. That's the size of the Russian middle class inside Russia. Yeah, that's London, Israel, Berlin, Vienna, Princeton University, Stanford University. That's where they are, and they're earning 20 percent above market average in all the countries they're in. What does that tell you? They're the best people, and they're leaving at 20 to 30 thousand a year. And there's already almost 10 million of them abroad. Can you imagine what is happening? Astonishing, correct? Okay. Meanwhile, back at home, you have a cauldron of roiling resentment. The main threat to Russia? Yes. That's right. That's the main threat to Russia, and it's a very big threat, and it's anguish for those of us who understand and feel for that country. Even before the oil price plunge, the crony economic system had dead ended. It was zero growth before the collapse of the oil prices. Essentially, they squandered their revival. I can explain how the revival happened in the question period if you're interested, but I'm just saying they squandered it. And to get anywhere better, what do they have to do? They have to overturn the existing system. They have to destroy the Putin system and the current elites to get any internationally competitive model. That is a deep hole you're in when your own regime has to destroy itself for your country to move forward. They may destroy themselves, but obviously unwittingly, which is what's happened now several times. To maintain the Putin regime means widening the gap with the West. It widens every year. Those people who are apologists for the Putin regime, this is your argument. You're saying we want to widen the gap with the West because that's what that regime is doing. Okay, so that's the Russian sphere of influence. Yes, 
They have cyber warfare, as we discussed the first lecture. Yes, they have nuclear weapons, as we discussed the first lecture, right? So they are a special power in decline. That makes them different from, for example, Angola. I could talk a lot about Angola. And in fact, a book I read two years ago on Angola is the best book I've ever read about Russia. But they have unique characteristics in addition to the corrupt, oil-driven, oligarchic personal rule system. The Angolan ruler has been there since 1979. So Putin has a way to go. Okay, next. We're going to talk a little bit about the Chinese sphere of influence now and then wrap up with the U.S. I'm going to leave Iran out of this lecture because I'm looking at the time and seeing I'm abusing it already. You know, um, actually, I shouldn't say it. <laughs> I think we're friends, but we're not that close yet. <laughs> Okay, so this is the China Greater Eurasia. Does it look different from that little piece of Crimea, right? Donetsk and Lugansk, Transnistria. Does it look a little bit different, China Greater Eurasia? It looks different to me, and there's a C version of it too, right? J you see Djibouti, you see the Straits. Yeah, this is the China version. So it's a very different situation with China. We're not talking about a country that is in the self-perpetuated decline, which is what Russia is right now. Self-destruction, which is what Russia is in right now. We're talking about a country that has ambitions. This I showed the first lecture, you'll recall. These are ports abroad where China owns a significant ownership stake. China's merchant marine is 200,000 ships. 200,000 ships. And these are the ports where they have a significant, in many cases, more than 51% interest. You'll notice that it looks a lot like the British Empire, doesn't it? Yeah. Sphere of influence, emulation. This map are the ports which are so-called dual use. That's where you start with trade, and you decide to build a military. You start with trade and you say, yes, we, have, we come in peace. We have no hostile intentions. We only want to trade and raise your economy up. And then you have a toehold, you have a port, and then you say, you know what? We will need to defend our trade. We want to make sure that nobody interdicts our trade. Nobody tries to undo our global trade. So we're going to defend them and we're going to build as they've done in Gwadar, Djibouti, and next potentially Piraeus, right? We're going to start calling there with our navy, and we're going to create dual use, commercial and military, with the ports. So you go back to this. This is already there, and this is the beginning of the dual use. So that's Chinese grand strategy. Yeah. And I got to tell you, they're very serious about it. This is, I showed the first lecture, right? The percentage of world trade. Look at this. U.S. percentage of world trade. This is the British Empire. They created the world economy. This is the U.S. eclipse of the British Empire. You can see already in 1900, look out, right? Before the British Empire. In fact, the British Empire is going to grow to its biggest height after that, after 1900, in the interwar period. And now look at China. And look how recent that is. And look at the trajectory, right? The sharpness. That's what we're dealing with, Chinese sphere of influence question. China has 20 neighbors, as we discussed in the first lecture. It's got more neighbors, 14 on land and six on sea, than any other country ever. It has more neighbors than Russia has. It has more neighbors than the Soviet Union had. So it's got borders with 20 countries, and it's in dispute with those countries in many cases. We talked about the South China Sea, and I showed you the military base that they built, right, on Fiery Cross Reef. You'll remember the picture. It was a coral reef in 2014, and in 2016 it had a 10,000-foot right, runway. 
for military ships. Okay, but the other thing you see from this map is that China has no California. That's the single biggest problem, geopolitical problem of China. On the one hand, they're boxed in, right? They have U.S. military bases all around their seaports, right? The U.S. has bases all up and down. Japan is basically a U.S. aircraft carrier, right? Philippines has U.S. bases. And so they're boxed in, even where they have water, and then they have no California. Instead, this is what they've got. You see this? You see what this is? This is farmland. And this is desert. This is encroaching desert. This is what China's West looks like. That desert is moving, and it's eating and eating the farmland. So if you go back here, this is all desert. And this desert is going this way. That's their California. That's a really big problem. If everybody in China <coughs> drinks an extra glass of water every day, this thing heads for Beijing. Right? That's their ecological challenge. This is very serious. Look at that. That's sand, and it's on the move. Okay, they have no California, but guess what? They're building a California. Here's Guadar. We talked about a dual-use port, originally commercial, now also military. And you can see the Chinese built infrastructure right through Pakistan onto the ocean. Here's the same story, but in Burma. Also, you build a gas pipeline, right? It's for commercial reasons. And then we have an outlet to the Bay of Bengal. And they can play a long game. If the Burmese government stops the infrastructure for a time because they feel the Chinese grip is too tight, the Chinese know they'll be around for a while and they'll be able to resume. The problem with their California is it has to go through Pakistan and it has to go through Burma. You see, the United States California just goes through California. It's a whole lot easier to have a California that you own and that doesn't go through potentially difficult places like Pakistan and Burma. Nothing to take away from Pakistan and Burma, but it's a much bigger challenge for that to be your western coast, for that to be your port, than for California to be your western coast. Then you have the roiling East Asia problem. World War II, it's not over yet in East Asia. It didn't end. The Cold War, it's not over yet in East Asia. This is a big problem. There is tremendous roiling historical grievance. Tremendous grievance over the war, which is unsettled. And it's the kind of grievance that's as greater, greater than we saw in interwar Europe, the grievances over World War I. You know how those grievances were manipulated. We got grievances at least as deep and in many cases, significantly deeper. And they're right there, not below the surface. They're right there in the societies, on their media all the time. So we have a combustible narrative, victim of humiliation in the past, and adversaries trying to hold it down in the present. Right? This is the resentment. This is the resentment. Now, I won't go into detail about where, you know, can China get better? Is China getting better? Right? Is how resilient is China? What happens when there's a crisis? I could talk all about the challenges in China. This is the main one, right? We focus on Tibet and Xinjiang because they have the ethnic strife there, but the big ones are Hong Kong, Taiwan, because those are alternative political models, right? So you have Manchuria and Mon Inner Mongolia are gone. They've been overrun by Han Chinese. Outer Mongolia is, is currently independent. Tibet and Xinjiang are being assimilated forcibly by China with the ethnic strife, but it's very hard to assimilate the Hong Kong and the Taiwan because it's an alternative political model. This is the deepest threat to the Chinese political system. They want to bring them in, and with Hong Kong, they've already done that in a partial way, and they would love to do it with Taiwan, uh, but it's not a simple proposition for them. That's bigger than the ecological challenge, 
which is big enough. Okay. Right? We can have miscalculation. There are many ways that China could have an explosion or an implosion. Many weaknesses, many issues, right? But even if there are no shocks, there's slower economic growth, there's corrosive corruption, there's demographic and environmental stress, and there's inability to stabilize the political system enduringly. That's without the shocks, that's where they are. Right? So this is not an easy situation by any stretch of the imagination. What the Chinese Communist Party leadership faces are challenges significantly greater than anything they've dealt with up till now. What do the experts on China say? Right? They say that China becomes aggressive when it feels strong and that it becomes aggressive when it feels weak. That's what the literature says. Right? We don't know about the decision-making process. This is the first time in history that a country has been this wealthy with this opaque a political system. Because opaque political systems smother wealth. They don't create wealth. But the Chinese system is completely opaque and the second largest economy in the world. It's something that we haven't confronted before. We can't see inside their decision-making process. Right? So Chinese intentions are not understood. And of course, US actions are unpredictable. Because what's the single biggest variable of all? The United States actions or inactions. China is no substitute for US power. We talked about the first lecture, how you measure power and what the measuring of the two side by side are. And I attempted to show that there's no way that China measures up anywhere near US power on any parameter whatsoever, right? It cannot replace the US to underwrite the international order. It cannot, and China knows this, right? Let alone the fact that a leader of any open system must itself be open. But openness is potentially the killer threat to the Chinese regime. So here's the strange thing. China, too, is nervous about the US possibly withdrawing from the liberal international order. China is dead set on gaining dominance in East Asia. And that means evicting or pushing out the US past the first island chain out to the second island chain. But nonetheless, China does not want to overturn the international order because they are the prime beneficiaries besides the US and the EU. China, in any case, lacks the capacity, let alone the desire, to underwrite a global international order. So if you look at the threats, where are they? Is Russia a threat to overturn the international order and put something in its place? Is even China, with its colossal sphere of influence emulation of the British Empire, is it even a threat to overturn the US sphere of influence, the Western? liberal international rules-based international order. No, that's not the threat. That's not the threat. <laughs> Communism couldn't be brought down from without, and the US-based power in the world cannot be brought down from the outside either. It can, however, as in the case of communism, be brought down from the inside. That's the threat. The threat is the same resentment, the same populist politics in international terms at the level right, of the international system, but coming out of Washington, not coming out of Beijing or not coming out of Moscow. That's the world we live in today. That world makes sense. I understand where this came from. My father was part of the white working class. And we remember the Nixon presidency very, very well. I remember this stuff because it was in the household. We have, however, incomprehension. Trump is a fascist. Trump is a unique phenomenon. Trump came out of nowhere, and et cetera, et cetera, right? There's far too much Trump discussion, far too much Trump discussion, and not enough discussion about long-term structural factors that he didn't cause may accelerate, but may not accelerate. These are things that were happening under Obama. 
They were happening under the second Bush, right? The Iraq war was not Trump, for example, as we know. Right? But nonetheless, we have incomprehension. The resistance to Trump. Let's think about this. We have a demagogue, low character, bogus accomplishments, and he speaks with immediacy to millions and millions of people. How is this possible? We still don't know, because we don't know these people. Remember I told you about Pauline Kael? She was the film critic of The New Yorker in the, in the 60s and 70s, and the most read film critic in the United States. And she said, Nixon could never have won the election. I don't know a single person who voted for Nixon. And she was right. She didn't know a single person who voted for Nixon. But Nixon won in a landslide. Yeah, they're out there. They're out there. And that's their voice. And I'm not suggesting Trump is going to do anything for them, but I'm suggesting that they're not so stupid. And they're Americans too, just like they're Hungarians, just like they're Austrians. And we need to speak to them. And they need to hear something from us that's valuable. 489 of the wealthiest counties in the U.S., they voted for Clinton. Yep. And what about the rest? The remaining? Yeah. Guess who they voted for? Trump won 30 states. Clinton won 20 states. Clinton won California by more than 4 million. She won New York by more than 2 million. And she lost the rest of the country by more than 3 million. Between New York and California, Trump won by 3 million votes. Yeah, that's right. And then we have his truthful hyperbole, which everyone so far at this institute has agreed with me that it's lying. And, <laughs> and then we have our universities that are denying that there's something called a higher truth. They're telling me, you can't speak about truth. You can't know the truth. Truth is just your interpretation of reality. Truth is just your subject position and where you're talking from. Truth is just your class position. And on and on it goes. I got to tell you, Trump is lying. How do we know he's lying? Because there is something called a higher truth that we can identify. If we can't identify a higher truth, we can't say that Trump is lying. You either going to agree with me that there's a higher truth, or I'm sorry. Trump is just speaking his mind, and he's not lying. To put it bluntly, you know, with friends like the universities, we don't even need enemies. That's the situation we're in right now. Yeah, and I live in two of them, and so I know this firsthand. So we have this big problem. The U.S. provides security in all the key regions because it denies Hegemony, it denies predominance to any one country in the key regions. You don't think that's hard? That's really hard. And that's really costly. That costs a lot. I'm a taxpayer in the U.S. I'm paying for this. The U.S. promotes an open market-based economic order. You don't think that's brought prosperity? It has brought prosperity. Not evenly, because markets never bring even prosperity. Never. But the absence of markets... We know what that brings. The multinational institutions, who helped create them and who's helped sustain them? So this is the liberal international order. The central fact about international politics is anarchy. It's not somebody being in charge. Somebody being in charge is rare because it's very costly to that country to be in charge and because it's very difficult to manage, to have the kind of power that stretches. And so the alternative is not a U.S. order that makes mistake after mistake, that's worthy of the criticism that we level at it, but the alternative is, you guessed it, anarchy. That's where we could be. Not a Chinese displacement of the U.S., not a blundering, self-interested U.S. order, U.S.-led international sphere of influence, but something very different. That's where, we're close. We're not th there yet, but that's potentially where we've been heading prior to Trump. We have faithful choices from Washington. Can American primacy pre 
preserved or restored? It shouldn't be. Do we keep everything that we've got or do we just let it go? You see, because we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, you have to have the people support this. Because if the people don't support it, then it's only a briefing in a think tank. Brilliant briefings in think tanks about how U.S. grand strategy should look are different from something rooted in a democratic polity that a majority of people will approve because it speaks to national interest, nationalism, right? Okay. Accommodation of China in East Asia, Russia in Eurasia, Iran in the Gulf. You want to just grant those sphere of influences and retreat? That's certainly a possibility, right? That doesn't mean a displacement. None of these are capable or interested in running an international rules-based order. Or do we end up then fighting a gigantic containment, maybe even bigger than the Soviet containment? Are the American people going to even get behind something like that over a long period, enduringly? There's got to be a new equilibrium somehow in which we recognize other states' interests, but we uphold core values. There's got to be. Otherwise, the thing doesn't last. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So we have the opportunity to continue the conversation. Asking questions, comments, please. Thank you. I've uh, followed your lecture the three times throughout, and uh, I've um, kept a number of things in mind, but I shall ask one particular question. Um, <laughs> We've heard a lot about the West here. Yes. And um, I think I'm just following in the line of uh, David Marcon and other people, well, unimportant. Um, I tend to argue that there is no West, really. Uh, let me explain. You've spoken about um, the West as a, a disciplining, a very successful disciplining circumstance, at least in the, in the first time. You've spoken about it repeatedly as the largest sphere of influence. Yes. Um, but uh, I still uh, see the fact that the West, the Occident, if we like, um, what had to be opposed to an East. Yes, there, there was always a counterpart, and it is defined by a counterpart, largely. Uh, now, that counterpart has disappeared after 1989, and uh, I wonder, uh, with all the contradictions that we've seen appearing between Western countries, with all the integration or interconnection with countries outside of that West taking place, um, is it, why does it still seem reasonable to you to speak about a West at all? That would be my question. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't agree that the West is defined in terms of another. I think that is a uh, paint-by-the-numbers trick that we see in a certain type of social science and humanities approach. The other in the scare quotes, and then to talk about definition of yourself in terms of the other. I think that's nonsense. The West is defined on its own terms. I can tell you what the West is about. Right? It's about markets, private property, prosperity, open societies, right? free economy, open societies, and liberal constitutional order and democracy. That's what the West is about. That's what the West means. The West means nothing other than that. It's not a geographical term because Japan was able to join that sphere of influence. And it joined only on those terms, the same way that Eastern Europe had to qualify to join the West. Some didn't really qualify, and they were let in anyway. I don't want to mention any names, but it did happen. 
It did happen. But so the West to me is a, uh, a series of values, a series of institutions, and an idea about itself. And the idea that it needs some other to go beat up on in order to define itself is a critique that's rooted partially in facts, but is rooted in, in a delusional methodology that runs through the social sciences and the humanities, in my view. So now let's get to what's happened since. Are the disagreements inside the Western sphere of influence greater now than they were 40 years ago, 50 years ago? Not for me, they're not. If you know the history of the Cold War, the disagreements were very significant. I don't even mention De Gaulle. De Gaulle is a crucially important figure in many ways, but he's the easiest one to point to for the disagreement. But there are fundamental disagreements about major issues, but there's a shared framework. There's a shared commitment of values, and there are shared institutions. Does this mean that the, the West lives up to its promise, its self-image? It never lives up to that self-image and promise, right? Just like Gandhi said about Western civilization, right? When they asked Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? He said it would be a great idea. <laughs> so I get that. I get that. I'm one of the critics, but I need something to criticize. If it doesn't live up to those institutions, if it doesn't live up to those values, if it doesn't live up to that behavior, then I'm going to criticize it because I believe in those values, those institutions, and that behavior. So I don't think there are greater disagreements now. Moreover, I'm not bothered by the rise of the West. I'm not bothered by the rise of the others either. I like that. I wanted the West example to succeed. I wanted other countries to begin to think that they could copy this, that they could emulate it and still be true to themselves the way the Japanese did. The Japanese are not European, but they're Western. The Russians are not Western, but they're European. Thank you very much. Professor, Europe was brought into a kind of disarray in its strategic thinking uh, upon the victory of Mr. Trump. And one of the subjects which I believe will be discussed when the EU leaders are meeting later to take, their first, take stock of the situation after the Brexit yes. will be should Europe move in the direction of a European integrated defense system. It, I think you might have an idea about that. Uh, personally, I would think it would be a great idea, and I've been arguing it also in my Danish newspaper, mm -hmm. including that we should actually try now, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe the chance is there now, where we are gonna have a stronger and sharper Europe. Of that, I'm quite sure that would be the effect within the next three, four, five years. Could you even imagine that we should have not anymore a French nuclear uh, 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 defense, but we should move in the direction maybe of a nuclear ax uh, axis, Paris, Berlin. I mean, really build up European defenses under the consideration that we can no longer depend the way we have been depending on the United States. Thank you. So you will see that for all of my faults and blindness, for all of the mistakes I made in three lectures, I did not make the mistake of talking about Europe to this audience. <laughs> I did many other things that might appear stupid to you, but that one I did not do. And the reason I did not do that is because I don't think you need to hear more about Europe from me. I spoke instead about uh, East Asia and about the United States. But let me say a word about Europe uh, as a result. I won't take a position on this particular issue. Uh, I'll wait to see how it plays out. But you know what I'm going to say. Because as my wife said, you heard it twice already the first time. Europe is a profound success. There are now 28 minus one countries in the EU. 
In my lifetime, I never imagined that this was possible. I still remember the founding six. I still remember the difficulty of adding even any to the six. Now I've got 28 minus one. Once again, though, Europe has mismanaged the success. And now talks not about success, but about crisis, and cannot be proud of itself somehow, despite this incredible success. This is confounding. If you landed from somewhere else and looked at what Europe has achieved, and you said, and they talk about it as if it's not working, they talk about it as if it's doomed, they talk about it as if they've lost their way, someone needs to seize the question of Europe and explain to the nations in Europe why Europe is a success and what it's delivering for them and what it's about. Stop with the fear. Stop with the defensiveness. Go on the offensive. I'm not a European. Many of you are Europeans. To me, it's confounding. Okay, Brussels, I understand. Brussels to you is maybe even worse than what Washington is to me. I know it all too well, and I have very sharp things to say about it. Things that can't be recorded on a camera, for example. <laughs> I know you can say this about Brussels, too. I've been to Brussels. However, that's not what Europe is about. We need a redefinition which goes back to core principles and core institutions, and then we need a workable version of Europe that works for the nations that are inside Europe so that you can get majoritarian opinion in support of the EU in the member countries. That's all. Now, does that involve blank or blank or this or that, right? Those are things you've got to speak about. But what's necessary for Europe to function? What's necessary for Europe to be? Not what's the most ambitious version of it, but what's the necessary version? the part which would make it work. And why do we need more than the necessary? Which I'm going to call sufficient for Europe to function. Sufficient for Europe to be Europe. We can calibrate our ambitions in institutional terms while being extraordinarily ambitious in value terms. This is hard for politicians to figure out, right? how to get people soaring ambitions and to get functioning practical institutions, which are less ambitious because it's the sufficient level rather than the most ambitious level. So that's an abstract answer. But, you know, I'm very bullish on Europe. Yes, they messed up the currency union in some ways. Yes, we all know that. Yes, all of this is obvious in retrospect. But, my God, these are fixable problems compared to what other problems have been fixed. How about the Nazi problem? Was that a harder problem to fix than the common currency? I don't think so. I don't think it was nearly on the same level. I, not at all. And that problem was fixed. West Germany and now United Germany is an unbelievably extraordinary story. It is an incredible country. It is a dynamic market economy with solidarity. It has an open society with solidarity. It's got amazing functioning democratic and legal rule of law order institutions. It made possible the liberation of Eastern Europe from communism. Solidarity is a story made possible by Germany, by Germany's success, right? So I don't understand why it's malaise, and, but you'll know from my second lecture that I talked about political entrepreneurialism. Political entrepreneurialism. We forget how valuable and important this is. Political entrepreneurialism is the key variable. Orban is an entrepreneur. Trump is an entrepreneur. I could go on. I could name the rest of the people you probably dislike with every fiber of your body. But I look at them, I study them, and I say, if I don't share their values, I want to see their techniques. 
I want to see their entrepreneurialism. And I want to see competitive politicians who can beat them in the marketplace of ideas because they're better political entrepreneurs. We've had such people. We've had a lot of great leaders in Europe. We've even had great leaders in Washington. Even in my lifetime, I've seen them. Right? It can be done. But that political entrepreneurialism is a, is a crucial, without that, you have only people organizing in the streets, NGOs or what we, you call civil society, right? You have all sorts of things that are flourishing, but you don't have the levers on the system without the political entrepreneurs. Maybe not a satisfactory answer to your question, but it's the one that came into my head. You're in charge, Yvonne. Yeah. You do what you want. This is also going to give you a way if you don't want to answer somebody. <laughs> be not afraid, Yvonne. <laughs> Just like John Paul II said. Yeah. Be not afraid. Uh, please, uh, uh, who was the next to speak? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I was next, but since I have the microphone, I'll speak. Um, yeah, two comments. You said that you somehow forgot to mention, in my opinion, that yeah. the Russian sphere of influence also, also includes Syria. How come you did not mention Syria? Okay. Secondly, um, you also stated that the Russian regime uh, that is not defending its state interests. I mean, what besides defending its state interests did Russia do in, say, Ukraine or also in Syria? It also seems a okay. bit off from my point of view. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I answer that one, Ivan? Because those are too big to let go. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about what Russia has in Syria. What they've got in Syria. Tell me what they've got. Go ahead. Uh, there was, for instance, a... Well, Assad wanted to build a pipeline. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, interfered, and it's in the interest of the Russian state that this pipeline is not okay. built. Okay, so, you ha so they have a butcher. They've got a butcher who controls a sliver of a former country. That butcher is internationally hated. Many people in Russia can't stand him. They're supporting him. What long-term strategy is that? Are they going to get... The country has been ruined. 400,000 estimated number of people are dead. The KGB did an analysis of the Soviet... Uh, um, Union's influence in Africa, and they came up with, uh, I've read the analysis, they came up with the story that the Soviet Union supports countries that are basket cases, that they're their friends, and that the main industry in all their basket case countries is civil war. That was Soviet influence in the third world. This was the KGB writing. So they've got nothing in Syria. They, it's not an ally, it doesn't have an economy, it doesn't even have urban, it doesn't have cities and universities and culture anymore because they've been destroyed. Now you can argue that what they've got is an ability to poke themselves and poke others in the eye in the international system. So if, they, if Syria continues to decline, but uh, Assad holds on to that little piece of territory that he's got, that this is somehow a Russia success. This is not a success. This gives Russia nothing. This gives the Syrian people nothing. This gives Russia illusionary hold or illusionary leverage on the international system. Syria is a prime example of Russian failure. If that's where you're successful, Syria, where 400,000 people have been killed by this butcher and his opponents, how is that some place that you're... Let's take Ukraine. What have they done in Ukraine? You've been to Crimea since Russia took Crimea? I haven't been. I have. Well, they have a military base there, and yeah. they want to keep it, obviously. Yeah, they, they had a military base before, but now they've lost the tourist industry, which was the economy in Crimea. That's a really big problem. And also, you know what they have? They have a pro-Western, Ukrainian-speaking Ukraine, which we didn't have before. And who created that? I'll tell you who created that. Vladimir Putin created that. Yanukovych was able to win. He won in a legitimate election. 
because he had Eastern Ukraine and Crimean votes. And Ukraine was divided between West and East, right? Now, Ukraine is more pro-Western than ever and more Ukrainian than ever, and nothing like Yanukovych could come to power now because Crimea doesn't vote inside Ukraine anymore. So what's he got in Ukraine? Again, he's got a country that was in distress before he came there. The Ukrainian elites annihilated that country. They made a basket case of that country with their misrule. Pro-Western, pro-Russian. It's disgusting what they did. And then he comes in and he creates Ukrainianism, Ukrainianization, Ukrainian solidarity. So you tell me how that's a, quote, defense of Russian nationalism. I could go on. I could give you details, greater details along these lines. Let's talk about, in fact, I'm sorry. Did, do you have something? Did I get something wrong there? Not at all. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. Okay, suppose yeah. I'll grant you that. What about the second point? What about uh, Syria being in the uh, belonging to the sphere of Russian influence? What about that? Didn't yeah, you? what's that worth? Tell yeah, me what's still, that it, worth. Syria is in yeah, the Russian sphere of influence, which is something not that Syria. you forgot. There's a part okay. of Syria controlled momentarily by Assad, which I don't predict is going to last, and they have influence with him. And then what have they got when Assad goes? I got to tell you something. You know what? The United States has ally in South Korea. The government changes. One's more pro-American, one's less pro-American. It's a gigantic economy. It's an open society. It's an incredible ally. Okay? I could go on. There are 70 allies like that, formally, that the U.S. has. You tell me what Russia's allies look like. You know, when I say the KGB did this analysis of who our friends were and where our sphere of influence was, and that was when the Russian, the Soviet sphere of influence was significant, and yet it was basket cases, right? They had to, it took a, a, a single Soviet transport plane, an entire gigantic military, just to send one tank to Africa. It cost them a fortune to participate in those incredible civil wars. And so Putin is doing it more cheaply, but with the same effect, right? You've been to Chechnya? No, I haven't been. Yeah, well, Chechnya is a positive outcome from the Russian sense. Syria, if it were positive, would end up like Chechnya. That is to say, there would be a strongman ruler who would corruptly rebuild skyscrapers in homage to himself, right? And declare fealty to the Kremlin while murdering people left and right and having the KGB complain to Putin about him. I'm sorry, the FSB, right? I mean, I take your point that they've got something in Syria, but it's negative value. You know when you have a factory and the stuff it produces is worth less than the inputs it goes in? That's called negative value in economics, right? Let alone the negative externalities like pollution and the other things cause. We're just talking about the value of the inputs and the outputs. That's what you've got. That's the Russian sphere. Listen, it doesn't make me happy. I'm not happy that this is the case. I'm not anti-Russian. Believe it or not, I'm pro-Russian. That's why I'm angry. Um, quick question. Do you think we've reached the high point of resentment and populism in the West? Uh, a, a very important question, I understand. I'm not that good at predicting the future. And so, I, you know, I don't know if we've reached a high point. It could be we're just beginning. Moreover, I'm not afraid of populism. Once again, right, I'm pro-democracy with a small d. And so the Brexit vote for me was completely legitimate. Those people had no voice, and their voice was exposed. Their voice was allowed to come forward, right? Maybe they have regrets. The campaign was mendacious. They were promised things that aren't going to happen, right? I understand. That's politics, right? We all know about it. Parents sometimes do that with their children even, right? So I get it. I get all of that. But I'm good. If Marine Le Pen is successful, what does that mean to me? That means that there are people who are listening to her and think that the system is not working for them. And so she's challenging the system to respond, and not just to respond in negative fashion and to say, okay, let's all gang up to stop her. Where's the positive vision? 
where, why not go into those neighborhoods, those regions that vote for her, and tell people a story that's meaningful to them, right? And make them part of the political system, but on your side, not on her side, right? That we don't have that yet. We don't have that political entrepreneurialism defending those voiceless people, right? Systems produce winners and losers. But just because people lose in something that's successful doesn't mean we don't have to pay attention to them, right? We can enjoy our success and pay attention to those who don't have success. Our problem is we focus on inequality. Inequality is a condition of prosperity. The issue is mobility, upward mobility. If inequality is increasing, but upward mobility is increasing, we're in great shape, right? If inequality is decreasing and upward mobility is decreasing, we're nowhere, right? We have to figure out again the upward mobility question, how you give more opportunity, you spread opportunity. Systems become ossified. The successful, when they get successful, kick the ladder away. They climb up, they're on the top, and then the ladder goes. And it's only for their kids. It's only for their people. This is, you know, sociology 101, org theory 101, meaning, you know, organizational theory first class at university, right? So every system needs to be jolted. It needs to be broken open, right? You know what Trump has done? He broke open the American system. This was very important. He's achieved nothing, and that system is holding on. But he created an opening. He destroyed the Bush dynasty. He destroyed the Clinton dynasty in a single electoral cycle. I love him for that. <laughs> he's not fixing anything, and he's created a family regime. Family in Siliviki. It's astonishing, but nonetheless, the system was so stultified, it was so ossified, there was so little opportunity, there was so little voice for so many people. And there was an opening now, and that opening is huge. But, yeah, but where are the political entrepreneurs? Where's the creation of opportunity, the spread of opportunity, the focus on mobility, upward mobility, right? That's the key. That's what makes a society dynamic, successful, that's what makes democracy stable. Because no middle class, democracy doesn't last. If everybody is losing from the system, they don't want to keep the system necessarily. Right? That's the threat we're facing. So I can't predict you know, if we're peaking or we're not peaking. It's going to depend on this absence or presence of political entrepreneurs who are going to speak to those rightfully disaffected people. Thank you. I, I know you know that Graham Allison is coming out with a new book about Thucydides Trap and the potential for conflict, mainly with China, when you have a rising power. I suspect that you disagree with him on that topic, actually, but I would like your point of view. So, uh, you know, Thucydides, it's hard to uh, talk seriously about Thucydides and Graham Allison in the same sentence, but uh, Graham Allison is a great figure, but Thucydides something different, he wrote about, you know, the inevitable conflict, Athens and Sparta. One was the dominant power, one was the rising power, uh, the rising power had ambitions, the dominant power wanted to hold the rising power down, and sort of war looked inevitable. And so China is, we had this in the first lecture, as you'll you recall, China is a rising power, the U.S. is the dominant power, is conflict inevitable? We had the rise of German power on the continent. That didn't end well from 1870 to 1945. We had the rise of Japanese power in East Asia. That didn't end well, right? And we had the American-British case, where the British gave way, partially reluctantly, and the Americans pushed them aside, right? And that was not a conflagration and a war. That was instead the um, mythology, the delusion of the special partnership. Right? which has worked for everyone really well, like a marriage. You always have to have these mythologies about each other in order for the marriage to survive. Goes a long way yeah. 
Okay, so, um, you know, social science does this. It takes a couple of historical examples, and then it decides that there's a rule, or a law, or a trap, right? For a long time, there was something called uh, Catholicism is incompatible with democracy. You won't remember it because uh, you were young then and Mussolini was in power. Is that me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. You know, nothing against Mussolini uh, and Italians and everything else. But there was this argument in the same... Uh, um, a journal that Graham Allison writes for, Foreign Affairs in the Establishment Journal in Washington. It's actually in New York, but it serves Washington. It's a great journal. And the argument was that, you know, these Catholics can't do democracy. Look, look at Southern Europe. They can't do it. And then it turned out that the Catholics, they could do democracy. And so what did it become? It became, oh, those Eastern Christians, those Eastern Orthodox, they can't do democracy. It is sort of, it's just inherently they're incapable. The values conflict. And then it turned out they could, and then it became the Muslims can't do democracy. There's an inherent conflict, there's a value conflict, and the Muslims can't do democracy. So, so now we're, we're, that's where we are in the stage of this, right? And so we have these uh, patterns that we create which become laws. Patterns are not laws. Patterns are what you learn from history. But history doesn't necessarily repeat itself. History is open. As long as you understand the structural forces at work, right? War comes from miscalculation. It comes from miscalculating risks, miscalculating benefits or costs, right? War is not an accident. It's a miscalculation. People talk about how everyone stumbled into World War I, right? Barbara Tuckman. And then we had Christopher Clark wrote this fantastic rewrite of Barbara Tuckman with more stuff on the Austrians and the Serbs. But it's the same argument, sleepwalkers, right? Here's the problem with sleepwalkers. Just to move the horses, just to move the fodder that the horses ate took more than 1,000 orders from the Kaiser's office. So you don't sleepwalk into war when you have to send 1,000 orders that you sign just to move the food for the horses, correct? So it's not sleepwalking, it's miscalculation. It's a decision. It's a decision that elites make. The problem is the narrowness of the decision-making apparatus, right? One person, Xi Jinping, two people, six people can make these momentous decisions. Here we sit in Europe and Donald Trump could bring the world to war. He's not consulting us. He's not asking, geez, what if I go to war, would that be okay? Would you guys be good with that, right? So that's the problem. We have the problem that decision makers can get us to war. But that's also not a given. And just because China is rising in a US dominated world doesn't mean that China has to be stupid and the US has to be stupid. They can instead cooperate, right? There has been nothing more important to China's success than the US. The U.S. is the single biggest factor to China's success. Remember I talked about there's a sphere of influence of the West and it's in East Asia too? And how Deng Xiaoping was looking at Japan and it had been crushed in World War II and was in the ashes and it rose to become the second largest economy in the world. And then the same thing happened with South Korea and the same thing happened with Taiwan. And Deng Xiaoping looked at this and said, how did this happen? And it happened because they were partners with whom? Partners with the United States and they sold manufacturing goods into the US market. And China made that strategic choice when Deng Xiaoping came to the US in 79. It changed from the Soviet Union as its sphere of influence to the US. And it was able competitively to make goods to sell into the US market what Eastern Europe was never able to do. One of the reasons why Eastern Europe failed in the 70s and 80s was East Asia was successful. The East Germans, the Romanians, they had nothing to sell. The Chinese would eventually have something to sell, but the Japanese, the South Koreans, and the Taiwanese had plenty to sell. And in a competitive marketplace, you have to win the consumer, right? So what we have there, right, what we have there is China rising 
because of a de facto partnership with the U.S.? Who guaranteed the security? Who guaranteed the open institutions? Who brought, created and brought China into the WTO, right? You could go on and you could go on. You can't imagine China today without U.S. power. You can't imagine it, right? And the Chinese are not stupid. They understand this. The problem is the potential for miscalculation. Evicting the U.S. past the first island chain, past the second, you know, East Asia has a first island chain, has a second. I didn't put that map on. I'm sorry, but uh, I should have put that map now that I see I'm talking about it so much. But, you know, move the U.S. fleet out beyond, way beyond Chinese territorial wars and dominate East Asia. That they want to do, but without, as I said, giving up the, um, the U.S.-based liberal rules, the rules-based order, right? And so that's the calculation they have to make. And then we have to make a similar calculation on our side, which is to say how much of China's rise is okay by us and how much of China's rise is a problem for us, right? That's negotiation and diplomacy, not only military. The challenge is that China is an opaque political system. And there's a lack of confidence over the long term in dealing with an authoritarian regime that's very powerful. The U.S. feels very uncomfortable being in partnerships, having a system depend on uh, authoritarian regimes. And the Chinese communists, right, the, their regime is the whole game for them. So this is where the miscalculation can come in on both sides. But no, it's not inevitable. And Joe Nye is a fantastic, amazing scholar. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have four of us who are going to ask questions. You're going to listen to us, and then okay, it's going to be your final uh, Thanks very, very much for the presentation, which I found, on the whole, very convincing and even inspiring. But at the end, I, I, I was puzzled. Uh, you talked first uh, about Russia, then you talked about China, and that left me with the impression that the only way out or the only future lies in, in anarchy. Then you turn to the US, and then you said that the US has important uh, decisions to take or to make. And that gave me the impression, uh, my, my question is, are you saying that whatever the US will decide, we're still doomed for anarchy? Or do you think that the US could or will take us out of the anarchy? And if so, how? Thank you. Although I learned now that you don't like any predictions, I tried. I'm quite often in, in Russia, and hmm. um, I would be interested to hear from you the situation in the Kremlin for the next 12 months. We all know the strategy of Putin, how he wants to survive, how he is trying to influence uh, the population. Now, seeing that his support in, in the country itself is somehow deteriorating, and seeing that there will be presidential elections in, in, in one year, what are you expecting uh, in a Putin strategy to, okay. since 2018? Uh, can it become dangerous? Okay. There is one question there and then I'll start your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, after what you said about inequality, I shouldn't make a remark that I was, go I was going to ma that I'm going to make, but let me try nevertheless. I think the model of the West that you outlined uh, can in one in, in one sense even be stripped down more hmm. and in another sense has to be completed. I think the model of the West is an ec economic and economistic model. Uh, its, uh, its success is based on a machinery that, uh, that assures the maximization of aggregate welfare over a certain region, over a certain policy making area uh, for given resources. Uh, that, that's, that's one part. The other part, however, is philosophical. It is the philosophy of liberalism. It uh, has, has nothing to do with the, with the economy. 
and uh, there are connections between the two, of course. In order to um, in order to keep the machinery of the market uh, of, of a market-driven economy going, you need a certain amount, but not not uh, unchecked, but a certain amount of economic uh, liber liberalism. That that you can have too much of it uh, was shown in the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, what I want to complete the model with is exactly the notion of inequality. Yes. Uh, Inequality is, is, not, is not a wholly economic category. It is not, is not a, an a, uh, indispensable ingredient to the working of, of the market economy, not at all. It, it is a, a philosophical, a socio-philosophical concept. And of course we don't want an egalitarian uh, uh, economy because this, this would kill incentives. But we don't need too much, we can't, we can't accept too much of inequality, of, of uh, unjustified inequality. And that's why economists also measure inequality. Um, Professor Ed Atkinson and, and others, uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, has written about it. So it's, it's, it's really simplistic to put inequality the way you did it in, in your model of the West. Can I also ask a question? Because the way, in a certain way, you're presenting, and I very much agree this is success, but normally uh, political regimes are destroyed by their success, not by their failures. So you have three kind of interesting paradoxes. One is that post-1989 post world was declared as a victory for all. When the Cold War ended, the major message was no country, no society is losing. Communism lost, but Russia won, America won, Europe Russia won. Russia brought down the Soviet Union? Exactly, absolutely. So strangely enough, now you have an order which nobody is ready to defend. Russia yeah. is a revisionist power, trivial one as you put it, I very much agree. China is a revisionist power, not a trivial one because of success. But the United States is a revisionist power, particularly when it comes to a trade issues. So I'm saying this because you said the sphere of influence is very much also imitating your regimes, your institutions, basically your practices. What I find interesting about the Russian position is that Russia is challenging the West, not by coming with any alternative, it's not Soviet Union, but by imitating. But they believe that they're imitating what is the real West. Mm. Not what the West basically is saying, but what the West is doing to us. So from this point of view, imitation itself is becoming an instrument for subversing this very order. And this is nevertheless that when you talk about capacity, about power and so on, yeah. you don't have anything there, but you have this negative capacity based on the resentment with the system. It's the yes. hypocrisy of the West and not the West that Russia yes. is challenging. How this fits? Okay. And I am going to ask this because there is in my view one important thing that has happened and uh, American obsession with the Russian uh, interference in the elections, real or not, is important of this. Before the nation states has a natural monopoly over knowing more about their own populations mm. than other people's government. Mm. If you remember basically how the United States were trying to study Soviet society, Harvard projects, you're getting immigrants, you're asking them questions. Now with the big data, you can end up mm. that some of a government of a foreign country can know more about you as a nation state. And if it's not true in the case of the US or Russia, it's obviously true in the case of the small countries or company can know more. How this is changing the idea of a sphere of influence? Okay, okay so uh, what do I have to answer? Two minutes to answer those <laughs> six, six questions? Six questions uh, out of four people? Yeah, so inequality is the uh, organizing principle of the left. And so when I talk about inequality as not being the principal issue, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a mistaken leftist approach that does itself a disservice. I recognize that inequality exists. I've read many studies on inequality and not just the social democratic ones. There are conservative studies, conservative economists who study inequality. When I talked about the West, what did I say? I said it was values and institutions. 
values and institutions. It's an open society. It's a rules-based legal order. It's a democratic polity. It's an open dynamic economy. Those are values and institutions. We can then debate those values and institutions. You like more regulation, somebody else likes less regulation. Those are completely legitimate debates. There's no question that those are legitimate debates. When you have a nice framework, like the West, which enables nonviolent discussion and settlement of differences, you can't expect a society to think the same. You expect a society to be very pluralist in its thinking. And you just need mechanisms. And so we can have a discussion of inequality. My own view, which I don't attempt to persuade you, is that it is a mistaken political project. That it's not going to deliver for the very people we're hoping to deliver because those people need opportunity. They don't. The inequality debate is a distraction from the core fundamental problem of a lack of opportunity. These are my views. You don't have to share them, but those are my views. What the economists argue for is a reduction of inequality. Cut off the, the unjustified levels of success that you put in. There's no one, there's no once, again, the, w once, again, that's, once again, that's a debate. I understand that debate. And some people think that inequality should be reduced. For example, there should be higher taxes or whatever. I take no position on that. I'm taking no position whatsoever on that debate. I recognize that as a legitimate debate. I'm just telling you that the organizing principle of the left around inequality is not a successful strategy in tactical terms. That's my opinion. Never mind the identity politics, which is the bigger problem than the inequality story for the left the destroying itself. OK, now, the Kremlin right now. You know, I'm not sure I know more than you know, so I'm not sure I have any value to add. But the regime is about self-preservation. And so uh, everything is a hostage to the electoral victory. He could move the election up in a, on an unexpected, unannounced fashion to cut short the electoral period. There is only one other candidate who they legally won't allow to run, and they may put him in jail again. Uh, their problem is not him, uh, because they can manipulate that process. Their problem is the vote total, because they'll need fraud in order to get a, a, uh, a non-humiliating number in Moscow for the re-election. They can't get a smaller number than they got in 2012, because that means they're in decline. And it's very hard to manipulate uh, vote counts now because we have uh, cyber capabilities to get inside systems and see what the actual vote count totals are. So it's a self-preservation story, and then nothing. You know, what comes after that? I don't even want to talk about it. But here's the problem. As regimes get towards the end game, as authoritarian regimes uh, overstay their welcome, the existing elite structures need to guarantee their future. Right? Remember Mubarak? He was over 80 years old, and he had cancer. And the existing elites who are tied to that Mubarak regime have everything at stake, all their property and their freedom. Right? All their money and all their freedom is at stake in any transition. So what you see in an authoritarian regime is a struggle inside the elite apparatus to deal with the succession issue, the uncertainty of continuation into the future. This is every authoritarian regime, right? Not just the Putin regime. And so, and so, how long does the Putin thing continue to go? Let's remember that he's not well loved by the elites inside that system. They don't like what's happening to the country, and they know it better than I do. They have better information than I have by a lot, because they run the system. Right? And they're patriots, many of them, just like Putin is a patriot in his own way. Right? So that system could, could undergo inter-elite competition and struggle. Now, if the Putin thing keeps going, you're, you're facing potential post-Putin collapse, right? 
You collapse in a heap. Putin's whole story was rescuing the Russian state from the Yeltsin era collapse. Because as I argued, the Soviet collapse didn't end in 1991. It continued all through the 90s. Now, this Soviet collapse, Putin arrested the Soviet collapse. It stopped. The system was able to rebuild a state, right? But that quest to be, rebuild a strong state has ended in what? Personal rule and even more corrupt system, dysfunctional system now. And so the, the very real possibility is that this unravels and that Putin's life project of rescuing the Russian state needs to be done by his successor again. That's the irony of Putin's rule. He could have gone down as the man who rescued the Russian state, and he may go down as the, as the man who, like Gorbachev, destroyed it again. I don't predict that. I'm just saying that that's a possibility. And, that, uh, and then we have inside that the intra-elite competition for the succession problem. Nobody wants to lose their position, their property, their power, right? Their, their patrimony that is for their children. And so we could well see uh, a significant struggle, not during the election, but after the election, in, to deal with the succession uncertainty. All right. I, once again, I don't make any predictions, right? Authoritarian regimes are susceptible to elite power struggle. And elite power struggles are sometimes triggered by what happens in the streets, and sometimes not triggered by what happens in the streets, but just triggered internally, right? The, the brave people who come onto Tahrir Square in Egypt, right, set off a, a, a struggle inside the elite apparatus. A bunch of cowards, a bunch of non-entities, you know, all the, the, the lowlifes that Mubarak appointed so they wouldn't threaten him, that they would be not as qualified. Right? That's called negative selection in sociology. That's what these regimes do. But even those people can become somewhat entrepreneurial by latching on to the courage, the resistance that you saw in the streets. Right? So in the Russian case, however, they can enter into those internal struggles without anything in the streets. That's the majority of authoritarian cases. Right? Until recently, almost all authoritarian regimes were destroyed in a palace coup. That's how they died. Now, we're, they, they're, they've mutated. They're somewhat different. So it's hard to see where the, the possibility... Okay, let's get to the U.S. anarchy and the U.S. revisionist power question because those are two versions of the same question. I think this is going to end. I think we're going to... I'm sorry, I think we're over time even. Uh, I'm not good at short answers. <laughs> I think that I've proven that over three lectures. Sorry. Um, so that's why I don't do television. Um, not only, but that too. Okay. So, what, I've, what have I said in three days? What have I actually said? What's the takeaway message here over three days? The takeaway message is that the Western sphere of influence is a stunning achievement and needs to be preserved, but is in a decline, a self-started, right, self-initiated structural decline. Not an end, not a collapse, not a Soviet scenario, but there are problems with the West that the West itself has been doing to itself. Not Russia, not China. The China story is a remarkable story. It's an incredible story. And I hope it continues. I hope they have even more success. I'm very impressed with what they've been able to do, and I would never sell them short, even though I listed their problems. But they cannot substitute for the US. So they're not going to displace the US in that sense. The US is either going to displace itself, and we get to the anarchy, or the US is not going to displace itself. We don't know the answer to that question, just like we don't know the answer to what the EU is going to look like next year and the year after, because that's up to us. Right? That's up to us as publics and as our political entrepreneurs. It's wide open and possible. The US has done many bad things, including to itself, and it's come out the other side even stronger. 
I remember the 70s, that's where these lectures began. If you were alive in the 70s and the mid-70s, would you have predicted the success that followed? Watergate, Vietnam, oil shock, right? There's a resilience. There's a tremendous resilience in the Western sphere of influence. There's tremendous resilience in Europe and tremendous resilience in the U.S. system. And Trump is not up to the task of massive destruction. Moreover, Trump didn't start the problem. He's a symptom. He can add to the problem. He can worsen the West's loss of will, loss of understanding of what it is, inability to take advantage of its strengths, fear, tremendous fear of threats that are blown way out of proportion. He can exacerbate all of that. So far, it's very early. You know, we're 100 days in. There's 1,364 days to go of the Trump administration. So it's kind of early to write. I, you know what the Clinton administration was like its first year? I got to tell you, it was not very competent. A guy from Arkansas didn't know much about the world and about running the free world when he came to power. George Bush from Texas, Barack Obama, from, from what? What did he do before he got to Washington? Nothing. No significant accomplishments whatsoever, right? So we're early in this game. And Trump looks more unqualified than everybody else because he's got character issues that are fundamental. He's fundamentally dishonest in a way that none of these other people were. And the character issue is, 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 is gigantic as a variable in decision making, right? Yeah, you know, um, we could talk, uh, unfortunately, a lot about that, but I just want to, I, I don't want these lectures to end and the main point is obscured because I failed to state it properly, right? So the main point is it's early, it's not collapse, we're not at anarchy yet, there's tremendous resilience. We don't know how much resilience there is in the Chinese system because they haven't experienced a significant crisis yet. We're on the other side of 2008 financial crisis. And there was a lot more resilience in the global financial system than people understood there to be. In fact, the Chinese and the Russians thought the U.S. was toast after that financial crisis. They wrote about it internally and they miscalculated because there's a resilience in Western societies. There's a resilience in democracy. There's a resilience in rule of law. There's a resilience in the Federal Reserve, which is a competent organization and which, in fact, runs the world economy, whether you like it or not, right? It's not a democratic institution. So this resilience is there. The structural issues, the self-defeat is gaining momentum, but it's very early. It's not the end of the world. It, it, Trump could have little effect on it. I don't think he could reverse it because he doesn't even understand these questions, right? Which is not to say, like I said, that his predecessors understood them that well. Barack Obama figured out that the world was changing that China's power was rising, and that the U.S. couldn't impose its will everywhere anymore. And the result of that was to do next to nothing. But that recognition was a profound recognition. But we needed a proactive version. Once you recognize that, what are you going to do? Because omission can sometimes be as bad as commission, right? Everybody sees Bush, commission, Iraq war. People don't see omission the same way. So I'm not a pessimist. The U.S. is not a fundamentally revisionist power. The U.S. is undergoing a process whereby it's got to redefine how it is beneficial to America, to Americans, how it's nationalist to defend a global, open, rules-based international order. Thank you.